All right, so I will, uh, while they're setting this up, um, let me tell you really quickly, Amelia is going around with some uh, yellow cards that are pertinent to today's topic, uh, Tree Talk, and uh, turning Tree Talk into, or translating Tree Talk into great grants. Um, it's going to highlight some of the grant programs that we're going to be discussing. We encourage you to take notes, uh, write down questions, so that um, at the end, uh, if you have questions, you can uh, go off of this, and, and we'll try to field them as best we can. If you're thinking, hey, if I write all my questions on the front, where do I put the answers? Well, we, we left the blank, the back blank, so you can go with that. All right. Feel like I'm snitching for the Yali PD again. <sighs> okay, so first question you might have is uh, about uh, us and the panel and our topic today, translating t tree talk into great grants is, is why did they pick the policy geek to uh, start this off and moderate? He doesn't know anything about grants. He only does grants administration and does public policy. Well, uh, you can't hear me? Okay, sorry. Okay, so, uh, uh, a little, a well-kept secret at California Relief is that I, I also actually write um, most of our public grants and this, so. and um, that's one reason why I'm doing that, is that, is that I'm on the panel today. The other reason is that um, clearly public grants are being tied more to public policy. So, so there is a connection, and I think what we're gonna be talking about today is very in line with what we've been talking about much of today, which is messaging and trying to deliver your message in it in a succinct and meaningful way to reach your target audience. And the same applies to um, you know, writing grants, writing public grants. So one message that um, was, was very easy to uh, translate that didn't need a whole lot of um, interpretation was about two or three years ago when network groups started calling me and saying, hey, aren't we gonna be running out of state money really soon? And I said, well, yeah. And, and they said, well, okay. And, and I said, yeah, it's a bummer. And then, you know, the threats started coming in, and then, you know, a crank calls at home, someone stole my hubcaps, and I said, okay, okay, you know, we, we get the message, we're gonna work on that. So, um, this is a chart that goes back to where we were in summer 2013, things were looking a, a little dire. Um, in summer 2014, um, they, they perked up a bit, and this is, uh, you know, summer 2015 um, has, has advanced a little bit more with some other programs coming online. And uh, it's probably important to note that on that, that graph on the summer 2015, that does not actually include the urban forestry funds that we hope to get into CAL FIRE's budget for fiscal year 16. So that's independent of what's already calculated in the 2014 budget. So um, we've done a pretty good job of uh, growing from, you know, bare bones almost nothing to really creating the most robust time for um, public grant funding opportunities in urban forestry in California. Um, Thanks. <laughs> so, and, and new public grant programs and new public grant expectations come with um, new guidelines. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think we're going to be discussing today is that those, those days of the urban forestry grants where, you know, why do you want to plant trees? Oh, they're really pretty and my kid likes maples and, you know, et cetera. Those are kind of past us. And now we need to be getting into the specifics, the public policy element of why we're planting trees. And, and that's why we've focused in on some particular programs today. And, and one of the things that goes with Tree Talk is directly relevant to public policy, is once you start getting, combining the two, public policy and public grants, you start getting into acronyms, the black hole of acronyms. And man, do we love acronyms in Sacramento. We use them for everything. I was talking to someone last night, and they asked me a question. My response was something along the lines of, well, if we can get Cal EPA and ARB to buy in the idea of tying GHGs to SESs, then we might be able to get a new program through the NRA. And they just looked at me and I was like, what? That, that makes sense. <laughs> so, so then I had to translate that and that took a, about five minutes or so. And, and then we were able to then go on to the next dialogue, which is even if you can get through the acronyms, we do speak a different language and, and we need to figure out how to translate that language to, to people that are reading our, our public grants, that are writing our grants, that are the ones that are gonna be making the funding decisions for us. And this gets pretty complex. I mean, I still can only speak to climate resiliency for a couple of minutes before I start thinking, oh, is that right? Well, maybe I should read more about that. So we get closer. If we get away from the acronyms, we're out of the black hole, we're more on the horizon, that's great. But of course, what we want 
is the whole picture. So what we're going to do today is talk about uh, several grant funding opportunities that are available over the next several months. We've really tried to cover a range. They're all here on your yellow card. Um, you know, some of these are, are coming up in a few months, so if you're hearing about these programs, go, oh, that sounds really interesting, but I couldn't possibly put together an application in the next month. Well, you, you have seven or eight months to do it. Um, in the case of our program, uh, which we hope to be getting um, requests for proposals out in, in the next month, uh, it's, it's going to take a, a little bit longer. Um, or, or you're going to have a little less time, but we're going to allow for plenty of time to do the, the grant writing. So really quickly, um, you know, Active Transportation Program, that's a program we helped create a couple years ago. Um, we're going to talk about connecting urban forestry to that. We've got a panelist that has had success there. Same with stormwater management. This is a new program. I'm really excited about this program. It's Prop 1 funding um, that was just allocated in the budget, $101 million. Proposition 1 is the water bond that November that was passed in November by voters like you. And uh, it has um, a lot of money for very water-related projects. It is, it is very unique water bond in terms of what's been passed in California in the past. Everything really does need to connect back to water. We tried as advocates to get a direct allocation in there to, to Cal Fire for Urban Forestry. It really didn't pass the muster of the, the water test that was being applied to the water bond. So we did the next best thing. Got language inserted for stormwater grants that very clearly says green infrastructure projects are eligible, nonprofits are eligible, and they don't have to go through the integrated regional water management plan, which has been an obstacle for many in the past. EEMP, I've got to put this up here. I've spent 15 years defending this program or trying to strengthen it. it it's a great program. It is one of the most straightforward in terms of how you define your urban forestry project. It just needs to be tied to a transportation mitigation project. Of course, I think most people are aware of John's Urban and Community Forestry Program. Please note <laughs> that I had said pending. The $37.8 million that's been discussed by the governor and um, supported thus far by the Senate and the Assembly is still in negotiation. We don't know what that final number will be. Our goal is obviously going to keep it at that level. Alvaro is our, our lead partner on that and making that happen, and um, we will certainly keep you posted. We hope to have that resolved by September 11th. So uh, that's why in your card you'll see that if that's resolved, John's program will hopefully kick up in the fall. And then finally, um, just a quick mention about our program. Like I said, I do write um, some public grants for us. We got awarded some funds through CAL FIRE to do um, a subgrant program to nonprofits for tree planting and also for green innovations that would include community gardens, urban orchards, et cetera. We're working on those guidelines right now. Like I said, we hope to get them out in the next month. Okay, today's panel, again, uh, I give Cindy tremendous credit for uh, allowing me the latitude to um, look at who I thought would be the, the best fit for today, and, and really going back to our topic of translating tree talk and also tying back to the overall structure today of leadership. I really wanted Colleen here. Um, I don't know Colleen very well. I've talked to her a few times on the phone, and I've seen her win numerous awards at a variety of conventions and meetings. But uh, the one thing that struck me in our first conversation was her ability to really take some of the tech jargon, jargon that I was just mentioning to you and break it down into layman's terms in a way that's very understandable and can be well communicated in a, in a grant and an application. So we're really excited to have her. And if you want to read everyone's you know, real bios, they're, they're on the paper. I just uh, am go, going off the cuff here. Um, Aaron, I really wanted him here. Um, Northeast Trees, they've done tremendous work in uh, Southern California, working with a lot of disadvantaged communities. What really struck me a couple years ago was when I went out on a site visit with Aaron and his uh, boss, Mark, to, um, I think it was Ramona Gardens and Affordable Housing Projects, where they'd done some urban forestry projects. As we were going through looking at the trees and seeing if they're being well-established, the residents started coming in out of the house. The greenskeeper came up. The manager of the complex came up. They clearly had spent a lot of time developing relationships here and building that community trust and support so that they could take a stranger on their property who's walking up shaking the trees, and they go, oh, it's okay. It's Aaron and Mark and whoever this guy is. And, and, and that's, that's great, and that's the kind of community engagement we need. And then finally, Claire, I've actually known Claire for, uh, I think, about a decade now, and what continues to impress me about Claire is she's really engaged in, in policy and trying to make urban forestry um, better and stronger throughout the nation. She's engaged at the federal, local, regional level, I believe she's on the new FAC 10-year action plan advisory committee. 
And then, oh yeah, and did I forget that she also leads Amigos de los Rios and the Emerald Necklace, which is this just, uh, I think they call it a prototype for Southern California, but I tend to call it a model for the nation on how we connect parks and trails and open space, and really excited to have her. So in the next uh, little bit, we're going to uh, try to cover a lot of ground in uh, grant making, and then I'll wrap up again with some comments, and we'll open to questions, but we're going to kick it off with Colleen. Uh, tech guys, what this? Not that. Okay. It's already, I hate having a microphone, so I'm going to do my best. Um, so I only have 12 minutes, and I have four points that I want to make, so I'm going to go as fast as I can. If, wave your hand if I start talking too fast. It's definitely my biggest public speaking failure. Um, I want to reiterate one thing that Chuck said and reframe it a little bit, because I think it's the foundation of what I want to talk about. For most of the time that I've been involved in urban forestry in California, about 10 years, our money has come to us when the voters of California passed a bond that essentially said, here's our money, use it to plant trees. And so we wrote grant proposals that said, thanks for the money, here's how we're going to use it to plant trees. During that same time, the California voters and the people of California have been saying, we want to reduce greenhouse gases, we want cleaner air, we want cleaner stormwater, we want to reduce our energy consumption. And organizations like California Relief and California Urban Forest Council and all of our partners have been saying, hey, hey, we can use trees to do those things. Don't forget. And finally, it feels to me like almost overnight that message clicked. And now the government and the agencies that are relevant are seem to be saying, OK, maybe we'll let you use trees to do those jobs, to provide those ecosystem services, we call them. But what that means to me is it's no longer the people saying, here's some money, use it to plant trees, and we say, here's how we're going to plant trees. Now it's the people of California saying, here's some money, for instance, to reduce greenhouse gases. We need to say, here's how we're going to reduce greenhouse gases. So my first, I frame this as four pieces of advice for writing grants. The first one is, it's not a tree planting grant that you're writing. Think of it instead as a grant to reduce greenhouse gases. And I'm going to focus on that mainly because Cindy and Chuck asked me to. And because I think that it's, uh, my, my colleagues here are going to speak about different topics. And it's sort of the place where the urban forestry money, the most urban forestry money, is right now. So don't think of it as a tree planting grant that you're writing. Think of it as a grant to reduce stormwater, I mean, to, to reduce stormwater, to uh, reduce greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So piece of advice number two is, you need to have a basic understanding of how that works in order to develop a good project and then in order to talk about it in your grant proposal in a meaningful way. And so I'm going to give you, as an example, what I think you need to know about how trees reduce greenhouse gases, like the level of information that you need to have to write a good grant. You're going to see it's so basic. And then I'll give you some resources for that same level of information um, for other kinds of ecosystem services that you might be interested in looking in, in uh, writing grants for. So trees reduce greenhouse gases in two ways that are important to you for writing a grant proposal and developing a project. First, they pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, and CO2 is the most prevalent greenhouse gas. They pull it out of the atmosphere, and they turn it into tree. They make wood, flowers, leaves, fruit, roots. Roots are very important. So it's a very, it's basically a direct relationship. So the amount of greenhouse gas that's pulled out of the air is related to how big the tree is. The bigger your tree is, the more work it's done. So that's a foundational principle that you need to understand if you want to write a competitive grant. A little tiny flowering tree over the course of its entire life might pull maybe a ton of CO2 out of the air, probably closer to a half a ton. A half a ton of CO2 is about the amount emitted by your typical American family in a month. So that tree is not working very hard. This guy, on the other hand, a big solid tree like that over the course of its life, easily 10 tons. If it's growing in a big wide open space, the sky is really the limit. Um, if we're talking about a tree like the one in Jim Clark's uh, award today, that that's sort of unimaginable how much carbon has been pulled out for a tree that big. But the one point here is that it takes about 20 of this little guy to equal the amount of CO2 that this big guy is doing. So just keep that in mind when you're writing your grant proposal. 
The second way that trees reduce greenhouse gases is less direct. So if you plant a tree strategically to shade a building, you can reduce the temperature in that building so much that you really reduce the demand for air conditioning, which means we make less power, which means we have fewer emissions at the power plant. Now that all sounds like it's so far down the line that it can't, how much can it really matter? But the truth is in a climate like this, or most of the Central Valley where the projects we're talking about are today, in a hot, dry climate, the amount of, uh, we call them avoided emissions, the benefits from avoided emissions from using less energy are equal to or greater than the amount of CO2 that that tree pulls out of the air. So from a shading perspective, um, two big valley oaks in a park where they're not shading a tree do as much work as one big valley oak sitting in front of a house helping reduce energy consumption. So again, I'm not saying that you have to plant, that every tree in your project needs to be a big tree that, sh that shades buildings, but if you have here a spectrum of small non-shading trees on one end and big shading trees on the other hand, the more you can move along that spectrum, the uh, better off you're going to be. That was my one cheesy graphic. I couldn't resist. So that's, I think that's really all you need to know about greenhouse gases and trees in order to do a good project proposal and to develop a good project. In terms of things like stormwater, energy conservation, air quality, the same basic level of information you'll find in the community tree guides that were published by the Forest Service, what used to be called the Center for Urban Forest Research when I worked there for Greg McPherson. I don't know what it's called now, it has a weird name. Um, if you Google community tree guides, you will get there. And I believe that these presentations will be available, so the link will be there for you when you need it. So that was rule number two. Get a, have a basic understanding of what you're asking trees to do to develop a good project. Rule number three, adapt your project to suit the grant. Don't expect the grant to change itself for your project. And I think another way of thinking of this is go into the grant, go into reading the grant proposal, the, the RFP, with an open mind and not with a project that you've laid out every little step along the way because then you won't be able to react to what the grant is asking you to do. Just a little detour, I'm involved in a project, it's not a grant project, where it's actually easier than that. I'm trying to give away trees for a big state bureaucracy, doing a very, very big construction project that will go unnamed, and they're trying to offset their emissions. And they said, Colleen, figure out how many trees we need to plant, and is, it, is there enough money in all of California to accomplish this? So we did a lot of number crunching, and it was, painfully expensive and we figured the only way we could really do it was again to be way at the right end of that spectrum. Big trees, shading buildings, maybe we could find the money for this. So I went and I found some partners. I said, I've got some big shade trees to give away. Do you have a place for them? The first one said, I got a highway project. I really want to plant trees. I was like, well, they'll be big, but they won't be shading anything. And the second one said, oh, I want to plant a fruit orchard. I was like, well, there'll be trees but they won't be big and they won't be shading anything. And that's not, I, I can't do that. And the third one said, it's a drought. We want to plant succulents. I was like, that's not even a tree. Um, so I, I feel like people often come into this process where they, they have a great project in mind. And all three of those, I think, were great projects. They just, no one wants to admit that, the, that your project might not be right for a grant. So sometimes you just have to walk away and say, what I want to do here isn't going to work. But I think you also have the, the opportunity to make small tweaks that can make a big difference. So this is uh, San Francisco's Quesada Community Gardens. And um, this relates to something that Chuck and I were talking about. So the community garden, the connection to greenhouse gases is a little trickier to calculate than it is if you're going to say, I'm going to go out and plant 500 uh, live oaks in a place where there used to be a forest, I mean, where there was a fire. But in, so you think to yourself, okay, I've got this community garden. I have a vision of some small fruit trees. I'm still, my numbers are not going to be that great in greenhouse gas terms. What can I do? And I said, well, you know, can you plant shade trees on the perimeter? Can you, as they did in Quesada Gardens, can you have a big, wonderful native walnut tree? That might not, I don't know if that's a native walnut tree, but you get the idea. That's sort of the icon of your space. Is there a way that you can tweak it to be closer, to be more competitive now that you understand what's being asked of you? So um, 
another way that I think of this is, is it's kind of a question of respect. So the way we got here was the people of California said, we have these goals and objectives, and they handed them over to the legislature, who used the feedback from all of us to figure out ways to accomplish those objectives. They gave a bunch of money, in this case, to Cal Fire, whose job it is to carry out these, these expectations. We should do our best to respect and honor that process when we write our grant applications. How close can we get to asking, to, to providing what people were actually asking for? So rule number four, piece of advice number four, follow the lead and the language of the grant proposal. And by this I mean, they're always gonna tell you what they want. So this is taken straight from the, the golden, essentially Cal Fire's tree planting grant. They've said, desired concept proposal attributes, which is, in my mind, a checklist. Don't ignore it. Now, the first two aren't actually desired. The first two are required. Number three says, plant trees where there aren't very many. Number four says, uh, tell us how you're going to carry out these ecosystem services, uh, blah, blah, blah. For instance, one of them, well, I'm gonna, um, Okay, so he, sorry, let me take a quick step back. This is what CAL FIRE told us they want. Then when you actually get to, the, to your application, it says down here, what are the objectives of the proposed project? Explain how they're in line with the RFP for the grant type selected. Believe them. They want you to tell them this. John, you can tell me if I'm wrong at the end. Um, so I uh, was working with somebody on a project and they sent me their proposal and they had their budget and they'd actually just asked me to help them calculate the greenhouse gas reductions, but I said, hey, wait a minute, where's your education component? And they said, well, I think we've asked for too much money already. And I said, hang on, first of all, you haven't, you're nowhere near the max. You've told me that you want education to be a bigger part of your, your program. Cal Fire's telling you the project has an educational component. Where is it? So uh, again, believe them when they tell you this, and I think my suggestion is use it as a checklist. To, you don't mean you have to achieve every single one of these things, but there's no reason when they tell you, when they ask you their question of how, are the, how is this in line with our objectives, to not write bullet statements that reflect back to them what they asked you for. And I mean follow their lead and also follow the language. So instead of saying we're going to plant 500 trees as our objective, tell them, hey, you wanted us to reduce greenhouse gases, we're going to reduce greenhouse gases by planting 500 large trees and you told us that you wanted us to plant trees in places where there weren't very many, I'm telling you, we're gonna do what you asked us to do. We're gonna plant them, in, but we're gonna prioritize them according to the greatest need. We're gonna include educational signage in each planting location to increase public awareness of the benefits. So um, the bolded areas are actually what I've just taken straight from the text above. It's, I think, again, it's a way of respecting the grant process itself. Cal Fire or whoever is saying, this is what we want you to do, and you're saying, hey, I heard you, and I've done everything I could to accomplish that along the way. So that is my, uh, my four pieces of advice on how to write a better grant application, especially as it relates to greenhouse gases, and I'm available afterwards for any questions. But that's also my email address. If you have anything um, after today, just drop me a line. back in here or maybe not no worries okay well great thank you it's really fun to be here I've met so many great people and we are all about connecting the mountains to the sea and convergence so the different grants that Chuck mentioned I have never seen so many opportunities in the you know 20 years I've been looking at this it's a time of unprecedented opportunity and it really requires us all to think of ourselves as transportation experts, parks, open space, habitat experts, water resources and stormwater experts, greenhouse gas reduction experts. So just like we were talking before about diversity, it's also diverse perspectives of different disciplines and different um, lenses. So we are in our area is Los Angeles. So we have plenty of people and plenty of different cultures to springboard off of tremendous richness and we have a huge challenge, which is that we are not really well connected to nature. And a lot of us have been looking at studies of what the impact of that is. 
And I think there's a little bit of that urgency in every grant we write to try to help whoever we are, whether we're infants, toddlers, elementary, middle, high school, young adults, uh, mature seniors, we're all looking to reconnect to nature and become more resilient as a community. Like when disasters occur, I think knowing each other and being able to call upon each other and get help from each other is what's going to differentiate a community that fares well from one that doesn't. So our tree planting every Saturday, wherever we are along the Emerald Necklace, um, reflects and flexes to this bigger vision. I know it's really hard to see, but Olmsted and Bartholomew, a transportation expert, in 1930 were commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce to do a plan for the LA Basin. It would have created this wonderful interconnected network through the publicly managed lands of trails, Santa Monica Mountains, Rim of the Valley, Angeles National Forest, San Bernardino Forest, and a beautiful, thick, coastal wetlands and recreation and active transportation with a connection along the river corridors from the mountains to the sea. And as many of you know, what was done with that? Put on a shelf. So we took it off the shelf about 12 years ago, and many other people are excited about this plan. But our goal was to take recent college graduates and have them really interpret how this could happen. So what's happened since we started is quite extraordinary. We've had a lot of federal attention to our national forest. We had President Obama designate a portion of it as a national monument. We're trying to help figure out what that means. We've got another congressional study on the rim of the valley connecting the Angeles Forest to the Santa Monica Mountains. We know how important our forests are to our watershed, to our ecosystem services, as Colleen said, for water and air. So what does that mean we do every day as nonprofits that are helping catalyze and support our government? It's that we put on these different hats and look at the spectrum of opportunities that are available. And really from a child's point of view, I think is the best opportunity, best way to decide whether something is worthwhile. Because I know when you're writing these grants, you spend days on end without sleep. So it's got to mean something. So this little girl followed me around one day when we were along the river. And she was taking notes, but I think it's all about what we call the green lasagna, you know, really looking at air quality, water quality, habitat, access to recreation, celebration of culture, beauty, et cetera. And these are the vocabulary elements of each of our projects, whether it's a teeny weeny little project that's a tenth of an acre, or whether it's a 200 acre project, you'll always find these components in the project like a microcosm. So, we were lucky enough to receive, after writing a very carefully our grant from the Strategic Growth Council, funding to expand our little vision for the Emerald Necklace, taking a fragment of it and inflecting it to the broader region, which is, again, really exciting to think about working with all the different groups in our basin who are doing amazing work. And it's, it's like going from Philadelphia to Washington or New York City to Philadelphia. When you cross our basin, it's so large. So it's nice to think that we have one big uh, set of goals and visions by any name, whatever you call it. We worked very hard on creating this expanded green infrastructure vision. And we'd like to think that every city in the country would have its own version of a convergence between long range transportation, water resources, habitat open space and recreation. And that would guide the planning and the investment in infrastructure for the area. So in our area, working with about 60 different plans that were already written, because you never want to reinvent anything, keying off them and trying to understand the beauty of them. And then working with myriad stakeholders, these are the eight goals and vision items that we're working with. Um, it sounds a little complicated, so what I'd like to do is give people the, the idea of being incredibly complex and not reducing the complexity and very simple at the same time. So it all comes down to this broccoli stalk or this, this uh, tree looking figure which took actually 12 or 13 years to finally make that simple. And there you have the Santa Monica Mountains, the Rim of the Valley, the San Gabriel Mountains, the urban river corridor of the LA River, which you're doing beautiful work on along the Arroyo Seco, and the uh, amazing work of Northeast Trees and the inner part of the, the city, and all sorts of great energy. But it's all converging to this one big idea of being efficient. And my task today is to focus on active transportation. So picture those light blue lines and washes and creeks that are leaving the big urban river corridors as connectors between the mountains and the ocean. Now we're asking to get into the business as urban 
treat people of active transportation corridors. So we applied for um, some funding to do some trail work, and we have this taxonomy of all the conditions that the river, in this case the San Gabriel River, transects from the top of the watershed to the bottom, which we walked with the Youth Corps and identified, and they just keep repeating. These are adjacencies. You have you know, a, a single-family housing, Army Corps, multifamily housing, airport, and today I'm going to talk about school adjacency. But once you have your system of the area that you love and know and want to transform, whether it's the city of Richmond or Sacramento, or, then you can look at it from any possible angle to get to where you want, which is to have a, a myriad of amazing opportunities to recreate and connect with nature at different scales, really connected by a system of trails and networks that allow you free flow and passage. And who doesn't want this interconnected network that allows teenagers to get out of cars and start planting trees? We, we had this really fun grant from Cal Fire and Forestry to do education, and we called it the Tree Power Project, along major arterial in El Monte to connect the river work we were doing to the other river. But I think what's beautiful about this idea of complexity and simplicity and a little microcosm of any particular project containing all the ingredients of the whole is then you can start to move across and connect to your peers. So here we are, the, the, the star on the right. We're, we've been working for 10 years in El Monte with our heads down and really enjoying people and focusing there. But now we're ready to connect over to Union Station and connect to the work that our peers are doing on the uh, other side of the basin and break down some more barriers. And it's all about overlaying public transit with our urban river corridor network. And then bringing in healthcare providers who are starting to, we're coaxing them to write prescriptions to people who feel deficient in their confidence level that they're not walking around their neighborhood, it's a little rough and austere. Single most important factor when we surveyed was a lack of trees. So we can't get all the trees in quickly enough, but in the meantime, we can direct people to places where we could put trees. And this is a little hospital project. It's a historic hospital that we were able to recycle as a nature park and exercise area where people, if they fell, they could go straight to the emergency room um, but get their confidence about maybe going out to the bigger Emerald Necklace Network. And there's an, a, a clinic there for wellness where a lot of different providers are brought together to help people manage their chronic illness. And I guess what I'm saying is if we really want to change the culture and use trees to create active transportation networks, we have to think about it at many different locations and scales in order for the momentum to be built. And this is our idea of not the transit-oriented development that we've been talking a lot about as urban planners, but park-oriented development, little pods. So our goal is to have every little mosaic piece of the urban area function as a pod. And you can see that the trees are the most important ringing feature of that, where you'd have all the services that you need at any given point along the bigger network. So here we are at a school called the Durfee Thompson School. It was the second project we ever did where we convinced the school principal and superintendent to let us plant trees, which was very scary, because that might interfere with sports. And we were able to make sure the geometry of play was not interfered with, and the interstitial areas were recaptured for bioswales and native plants and shrubs. And we just kept building on that. And then we realized when the active transportation call for projects came out, there was a lot of funding in there, and we hadn't really seen a lot of our peers access that. So it didn't allow us to plant trees with that funding, but it allowed us to help children walk into school from around the neighborhood along the urban river corridor or sidewalks and kind of theme the walk based on different creatures that are found in the watershed. So this is helping us deepen our partnership with our local schools, which to me is whenever you have a question about connecting with community, go straight to the school. Because there's hundreds of people who show up every day in a trusting environment, which is hopefully safe and nurturing, that's a good partnership. So we, we got permission from the superintendent based on the quality of the trails and the native plants and trees we had put at this one little school, which is a magnet for orthopedically and developmentally challenged students, as well as an elementary school, to expand our network to the surrounding watershed community, in this case, watershed of kids walking into school, and do five different themed groups. They'll have flags, they'll have 
little vests and hats. I am the, th the monarch group walking in from northeast to my school. I am the thin-legged frog group walking in from southeast to my school. I am the steelhead trout walking from the south to the north. So this um, little coterie of students and their parents and volunteers are going to help walk students into the green school that we worked on. And I guess um, that's really what I wanted to share is this big picture, complex vision, multiple disciplines, have fun, and then the simple idea of just getting one child safely to school. Okay, cool. I get the distinguished uh, um, opportunity to, to, to be the last presenter, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm going to just show you guys a few images. Hopefully they're easy on the eyes. There's not a lot of PowerPoint here. Or, I mean, there's not a lot of uh, bullet points here. So um, I really wanted to just speak to you a little bit about Northeast Trees, who we are, if you don't know us, and uh, our involvement with different types of grants uh, that are related to urban forestry, but maybe a little bit outside of, of what some of you may typically um, do. So. Um, bringing nature back to urban environments is our mission, as is all of yours, I assume. And our founder, Scott Wilson, um, said more trees are better, just to put it simply, you know, that's, that's our credos. Scott passed away a couple of years ago. This is a photo of him. He was 90 years old. He actually passed away doing what he loved doing, which was climbing a tree. <laughs> At 90, he was up in a tree trying to prune something for his neighbor and had a heart attack, but um, he had a great life. I think some of you here may remember him, um, but he was really very pivotal in Los Angeles anyway with urban forestry. He founded Northeast Trees about 30 years ago uh, as a retired school teacher. Um, he taught at Crenshaw High School, North Hollywood High School, and then finally Eagle Rock High School. And at each of these locations, he set up some of the most uh, progressive uh, horticulture and agriculture programs uh, in the LAUSD. So he taught there for decades, and when he retired at whatever he was at that point, 70 years old, um, he actually went to Cal Poly Pomona and got a degree in landscape architecture. He was a certified arborist and licensed landscape contractor. And so Northeast Trees was very much developed um, based on his example of being, you know, is at, at, on the one hand, we're urban foresters who, who uh, you know, do all of the, and provide all the benefits that come along with straightforward tree planting in a city, all of the socioeconomic benefits that, that we've all discussed and the community benefits, but also our staff consists of highly skilled landscape architects, sometimes environmental engineers, urban planners, and they allow us to both design and build projects. So um, in addition to street tree planting and doing park, you know, open space tree planting, we also design parks, or we get involved in some more high level technical type projects, including stormwater, which is what I really wanted to speak to you guys about today. Since there is quite a bit of funding coming down the line um, for storm, storm water or you know, water related projects as uh, Chuck mentioned earlier with Prop 1, uh, this might be something that you guys all can, can uh, start accessing uh, if you think beyond just the normal tree planting. Now trees as we all know are, in our opinion, are the best form of capturing stormwater. It's a lid, a low impact development type strategy and intervention, which can infiltrate much more water than if you design something uh, heavily, heavily engineered project like I'm gonna show you later. They say 100 trees can infiltrate 250,000 gallons of stormwater. Of course, that's when they're mature and if they're healthy. And then as we've been dis discussing all day, trees have all of the other uh, benefits that should be included um, when you're writing grants. For example, it's a great opportunity for involving the community. It's, in, it's a, a vehicle for engagement. And our experience has been that working with youth in particular is the best tool for engaging the community, um, especially disadvantaged communities. There was a lot of discussion earlier about, about 
well, how do you make inroads with a disadvantaged community if you're not from there, if you're not familiar with it? If you're offering jobs, trust me, this is something I've done for 20 years, people will like you, they will connect with you. If you're like, yeah, I can give your kid a job, they're like, all right, come on, let's talk. What, do you want, what are you guys doing? So, which is, in the photos you see behind me, um, a project I did in Watts at Nickerson Gardens, which is, I think, the largest public housing community, also AKA known as The Projects. West of the Mississippi, it's 1,500 units. It's like a small city. Also, the birthplace of some notorious uh, street gangs like the, the Bloods come out of this housing facility. And I worked with the youth there. We hired about 20 youth, trained them, gave them green industry job training. And we planted almost 600 trees in this one facility alone. While working with them at, uh, and in Watts, we also took them out to other areas so that they could leave their community and see other and have other opportunities to do more like habitat restoration type work. Um, but the bottom line is that you know trees have so many multiple benefits and they should be included in in all of the you know different types of grants that we're going after, and including Prop One, um, which is more water related. But more to the point, um, since you know Northeast Trees works with, we have in-house staff of landscape architects, designers, etc. We once again we're able to work on projects that go beyond just the trees. So, for example, along the LA River in the Glendale area, we did a, a, a large park project called the the LA River. Uh, I'm sorry, the Glendale River Walk. Um, the LA River, just so you in case you can't see, is just to the right of that bicycle path. And as part of that linear park, there were many little rain gardens which allowed us you know, to infiltrate and capture runoff. Um, we also like to, uh, as part of these projects, include more than just kind of the physical infrastructural improvements or, or the greening. For example, part of our community, there's a lot of artists, so we always if there's funding available, we invite artists to, to uh, design and install interesting elements, design elements into the park so that they become unique, so that they're distinctive, memorable, so that it's not just a cookie cutter park along the river. Um, it's a place where you go and you're like, oh wow, that's interesting, I wanna hang out there. We also, you know, we'll use things like, uh, we'll get masons, This. For example, is a drinking fountain. It's ADA compliant, but it's built with river rocks. And all of the parks, everything you see there were, was built by our crews of young adults, our quote unquote at risk youth. So they're all getting job training, really high level skilled uh, job training when they work on projects like this with us. In fact, the, the lead, the, the young adult who was uh, the lead on this project after studying with us and, and doing this project with us ended up um, being placed as the, as the park manager for uh, the city of Monterey Park after finishing this. So this is what we like to see, like these more advanced projects can lead to higher levels of job training and um, we can then find more long-term employment and, and real careers for some of our youth because they work with us on these. Bioswales are another type of a BMP related that's water related in this case uh you know this is more of like a like a stream a, a sort of a, a, a artificial stream that allows water to infiltrate naturally into the soil and and also we're addressing things like uh, pollution obviously the water quality improves as it goes into the ground and is naturally filtered through biological or geological processes so these are things that can be included in your greening projects and will hopefully you know, qualify you for other types of funding. Um, in the mid-city area of Los Angeles, an area, um, a park called the Kenneth Hunt State Park, which is in the Baldwin Hills, we were asked to do a, bio, a swale, basically, to take this concrete culvert, which runs parallel to this major street, um, La Brea, and to naturalize it, to make it more appealing and to do a better job of ac actually infiltrating water. So we transformed that drain and we made it a soft bottom. But you see there's little touches of kind of more aesthetically pleasing. We use broken concrete and river rock together to form little masonry walls. 
and we planted all natives in and around this swale. And here you see it working that same year after we finished, um, the culvert was transformed into a much more natural looking and functional uh, stormwater or runoff uh, intervention. Now the nice thing about some of these grants also is that they can lead to more. So for example, after being funded and we completed this project, we applied for an EEM EEMP grant to then come back and plant almost 2,000 new trees along this corridor. So they, all, they start tying into each other. Sources of funding often you know, will build on each other. Um, you may start out with this, just doing a tree planting grant in an area, and maybe if it's near a river or where you have water uh, runoff issues, you can then build that and turn that into uh, a water-related grant. And, and you know, of, of course, all the while you're developing um, and engaging with that community um, in particular. So some of the more highly engineered and expensive <laughs> projects that we have worked on, um, along with tree people, Northeast Trees has really pioneered some of these stormwater capture projects. But this one is in a park, a city park called Garvanza in Northeast LA. The city of LA allowed us to take a section of the park and basically excavate it and install these giant holding tanks essentially turning the park into a giant cistern, which when it rains, if it rains, that entire neighborhood around the park the drains into this cistern, and this can hold a million gallons of water. Um, so here, this is a situation where we're a pretty small nonprofit. We had to hire and contract out this part of the work, but our staff were able to come in, you know, after everything was installed, the underground part, and we did the above ground landscaping portion of it and we managed it, of course. Um, here you see the subsurface drip system. So as those cisterns filled with water uh, after it rains, that water is then pumped uh, with solar powered pumps and used to irrigate the entire park. And, and we, of course, retrofitted the park with, uh, with new, uh, very water conserving irrigation systems. And this is what it looks like now. Um, they're, well, shortly after we covered everything up. So beneath this lawn area is a cistern which can hold up, up to a million gallons of water. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's a whole range of water related type projects that one can get into if you're an urban forestry organization. You really do have to, uh, you know, in some cases you might have to partner with companies or organizations that know how to design these type of things or write these type of grants, but there's clearly a connection between uh, the greening efforts of urban forestry and stormwater conservation intervention and community engagement. Um, water is critical to all living things, obviously, so um, it, it fits in nicely and I did take some notes, maybe we can talk later about um, when you actually do, I have some, some recommendations, you know, other than partnering with other organizations, but um, if you're really going after these type of grants, you know, we, we, we could, um, we, I'm certainly available as a resource to, to answer any questions about that, so thank you. Okay, so my really, my very artsy graphic here, because I'll probably only get to show this for like another year before people start going, oh, that's boring, yeah, we've seen that, so what, $700 million. Um, so, so I gotta take advantage of all we can and, and go back to summarizing, you know, where, where we are, you know, summer 2013, less than $10 million. Summer 2015, we just talked about $234 million. That's available, it's accessible, it's, it's, it's real, it's tangible. Um, you know, when the active transportation program was created, we were at that table and we were, we were really fighting to get green infrastructure and local parks and connectivity with um, greening as part of that program. So it is really exciting when the very first round of grants come out from ATP and I see Amigos de los Rios on there for two grants that were combined about three million. Was that ballpark? 
Yeah. So, I mean, and of course, you know, when we see uh, John's grants that were announced uh, a little while ago and seeing 73% of those funds going to the nonprofit organizations that, um, you know, many of them part of our network. Um, so we've talked about 234 million. We hope to see another 38 million soon for CAL FIRE. Fingers crossed on that. Continue to work that at the, the state capitol. And we didn't even touch on some of the other programs that are here that are also accessible. Um, you know, River Parkways, a new program on outdoor environmental education. We hope to see modifications to the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities program that'll bring green infrastructure back in as incentives. So uh, a really exciting time, unprecedented opportunity. I know we're running a few minutes late, but I'm gonna guess that there's a couple questions, so I will do my best to try to speed through them. Remember, you have your handy dandy cards and you can write on, on the back of them as well. So we've got them. Mike going over there, anybody? Wow. We were either that good or just you don't care about money. I hope <laughs> it could be either one. Okay, really, last call? No, no, okay, Rick. Under the park is a fascinating idea. Uh, solar powered pumps, re reusing that water, reclaiming that water for irrigation, I suppose. Uh, that was grant based? Yes, it was. Uh, that was actually a local grant, Prop O, which is City of Los Angeles grant that we received. Uh, in two, 2.5 million, I believe, was the total on that. Is there an ROI or a return on investment? in the calculation? Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually not aware of that. Um, there, these, these, some of these projects that we do are prototypes or you know, they're, we're, we're experimenting. Um, I, I can honestly say there's, there's a lot of discussion about the value of doing a more highly engineered project like that as opposed to, for example, low impact development, doing rain gardens in the front of every house in that neighborhood, which would cause a fraction of, of that project, and, and have less moving parts, less things that can go wrong. Um, to maintain a system like that is, requires you know, additional funds and expertise that sometimes, you know, the city of LA had to take it over after it was completed. So there's a lot of complexities to it, and we don't know, we don't have all those answers. I think that that's why I wanted to kind of show a range of the projects that we work on. Um, we're willing to, to, to try you know, these experimental, large, expensive prototypes, not saying, however, that that's the end all. We can't engineer our way out of this problem. Thanks. Anyone else? Good question, Rick. Okay, well then, uh, thank you again. I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy, but how about another hand for the panelists? in awe of the cistern. <laughs> I know I am. It's like, whoa. Um, it is 4 o'clock, and so we are, in theory, 15 minutes behind on the schedule, or a little late, but that's okay. Um, I, part of my feeling right now is that everybody's feeling uh, full up of information. Uh, I know, up to here, somebody just went. So, but the, what we have left for 15 minutes, or, and we can use this any way, is we, we had it as an open forum. Are there any issues you want to discuss? Can you handle discussing any issues? Oh, but before anybody walks away, Gene Nagy, Gene Nagy, Gene Nagy, we wanted to get a group picture. Maybe we can do something mindless like a picture, and you guys can, if you have a question. <laughs> but why don't, why don't we go ahead and do a picture? Do you want to stand on a chair? Yeah. Oh. All right, that means you huddle toward the center. You don't look like you need too much body space.
were our ideas? I think we've done a lot of this. Yeah. And so, Haiti, would you like to come and just wrap up for... Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming today, those of you that came yesterday last yesterday for the media training with Bobby, and today I thought that the speakers and the information that was conveyed was, was super valuable, and all of you have, you know, great ideas and have been doing wonderful work out in your own community, so thank you to everybody for being here today, and uh, we look forward to staying connected. Thank you.